Assessing the damaging power of radiation. Okay, I think we all know that radiation is dangerous, right? Um, but radiation can be dangerous in different ways, and some radiation is much more harmful than others. Radiation is dangerous because it interacts with other molecules and atoms and ionizes them. And this, in your living cells, messes things up. Okay, it damages molecules which can cause the cells to either die or it can cause them to reproduce abnormally, which can uh, result in cancer. And so the ability of something, of radiation to ionize molecules is called its ionizing power. So some sorts of radiation have higher ionizing power than others do. And another aspect that makes radiation dangerous, another factor, is the penetrating power. Some radiation can penetrate through a brick wall, and other radiation is stopped by a piece of paper. Okay, so obviously the one that can go through a brick wall is going to be um, more dangerous in most circumstances. In order for the radiation to damage your cells, it has to get into the cell. Okay, if it can't get through the cell wall, it's not going to have any effect. So we talked about three different types of radiation. We're going to look at their... the uh, penetrating power and ionizing power of these. So the alpha particle, um, I like this. The alpha, alpha radiation is the semi-truck of radioactivity. So the alpha particle is big. Remember, it's a helium nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. So this is, in terms of radiation, a very large particle. Do you remember we talked about light and energy when we talked about electrons. And radiation is a form of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so this is, this is a lot like light, visible light. We talked about photons being packets or particles of light. Well, radiation, the particles are larger. So alpha radiation, the particles are helium nuclei. And so this has... Um, has, can cause a great deal of, of damage. Um, it has the highest ionizing power. So it's going to ionize and cause damage. But because it's so big, it doesn't have very good penetrating power. It can't go through things very well. It gets stopped. So like it says here, imagine a semi-truck trying to get through a traffic jam. It can't get through. A little motorcycle could get through. Someone on foot could get through any traffic jam. You could always just run on top of the cars, right? But the semi-truck can't get through. So even though it has a lot of ionizing power, it doesn't penetrate very well. So if you have alpha radiation that is outside your body, it's really not dangerous at all. It can be stopped by a sheet of paper, by your clothing, even by a layer of air. So it's really you know, not dangerous outside your body. Where it's dangerous is if it's ingested or inhaled. Once it gets inside your body, then the penetrating power aspect is taken away and it is highly ionizing and so it can cause a lot of damage. Beta radiation is a little different. This is when an electron is emitted. So here we have an illustration. Here's um, a carbon-14 nucleus. Um, it's got six protons and Seven, uh, sorry, eight. Fourteen minus six is eight most of the time. Um, it's got eight neutrons. And so what happens, and this is weird, um, a neutron turns into a proton and an electron, and the electron gets spit out. And so we end up with a different element. We end up with nitrogen. We end up with the atomic number increasing which is kind of weird to think about. But a neutron, you can think of it as being a proton and an electron that are molded into one. And you can break it apart into the proton and the electron. The electron gets spit out, and the proton stays. So beta particle is an electron, and this is its symbol right there. And if we look at the symbols for the other ones, um, the proton... Well, that's not a good color. Let's go with something darker. The proton, 
what was its mass number? One, and the atomic number was one, because there's one proton, and the mass is one because there's one proton and no neutrons. So proton, and then the electron, we said had a minus one, it was a negative one proton, and it has zero mass. What happens if we add these atomic numbers and mass numbers together? We get a mass number of one and an atomic number of zero. Atomic number zero means no protons. This is the neutron. And so those, those symbols add up. So the symbol for the beta particle is, is this symbol right here. Um, mass number is zero. The negative one um, seems weird. But when you emit a beta particle, it increases the atomic number because you took a neutron, spit out an electron, and what was left was a proton. And if you can't wrap your mind around that, don't worry about it. So the nuclear equation for the beta decay of radium-228. Now this is beta decay. So the beta particle is taken out. So here we have this element. Um, nuclide or isotope, radium-228. The 88 comes from its atomic number, which is on the periodic table. The beta decay spits out an electron, and we see that these numbers add up. The superscripts on the right side add up to equal the superscript on the left side. The subscripts on the right side add up to equal the subscripts on the left side. Any questions so far? This is a, a weird way of, it just seems weird to students, it's fine, it is weird. Yes? Oh, that was just a stretching, yeah, preparing for something later, I guess. So what about beta radiation and its ionizing and penetrating power? So beta radiation is like the mid-sized car of radioactivity. So a lot less massive. The helium nucleus two neutrons, two protons, atomic mass of four, okay? Electron, so small that it doesn't really matter in terms of mass because it's like one two thousandth the size of a proton. So it's much smaller. And because it's less massive, it has less ionizing power. But because it's smaller, it has greater penetrating power. So penetrating power and ionizing power are inversely related. If you have high ionizing power, then you have low penetrating power. So because of their smaller size, they have greater penetrating power, and they can go through paper and clothing. Um, in order to stop them, you're going to need a, a sheet of metal or a thick piece of wood. Okay, So, you know, a few sheets of paper isn't going to stop them where it will stop an alpha particle. So the beta radiation is more dangerous when it's outside your body because it can penetrate through your skin. So you, so you don't have to ingest it. But once it does get in, it does less damage than the beta particles, I'm sorry, the alpha particles do. And then there's gamma radiation. And gamma radiation is completely different from the alpha and beta radiation. It is not a particle in the sense that the alpha and beta particles are. It is electromagnetic radiation. And so the high energy um, short wavelength photons. The symbol for the gamma ray is this, indicating that it has no mass and no charge. And it's the symbol gamma. So these are um, very, very high energy. This is what we saw at the at the far right side of the electromagnetic spectrum, where you have very high energy and very short wavelength. The gamma radiation usually comes off along with other radiation, so you don't often see it coming off by itself. Here's an example of uranium-238. It undergoes alpha decay, and when that happens, it also gives off gamma, gamma rays. Now, this one has zeros for the mass number and the atomic number. So it's not going to really, whether we write that in or not, isn't going to affect the balance of these numbers that we've been looking at. 
So we can't ask a beginning student to predict whether this reaction is going to give off gamma rays or not. So gamma rays are like the motorcycles of radioactivity. They can go straight through that traffic jam. Okay? They just weave their way because they're really, really small. But they also have the lowest ionizing power. So stopping gamma rays is pretty difficult. It requires several inches of lead shielding, not just any metal. It needs to be lead shielding or thick slabs of concrete. A regular brick wall just go through no problem at all. That's gamma radiation. Then there's another one called positron emission. Positron emission happens when a nucleus emits a positron. And as this happens, a proton turns into a neutron. So this is another one of those really weird things. So a positron, let's look at its symbol here. What other symbol does that look like? Remember the beta radiation, which was an electron? That looks like an electron, but it's got a positive charge. So this is like an electron with a positive charge instead of a negative charge. So instead of a neutron turning into a proton and an electron, we have a proton turning into a neutron and like the opposite. It's like the evil twin of an electron, a positron. So that's the symbol for the positron. It has a mass number of zero. It has a charge, I'm sorry, a, um, an equivalent atomic number of plus one in the equation. It's not a proton, but they gave it that symbol so the, the math works out. So, and when an atom emits a positron, the atomic number decreases by one, but the atomic number, the mass number doesn't change. Kind of weird. So here's one that does that, phosphorus 30. Phosphorus 30 emits a positron, and that leaves us with silicon 30. So again, the, the, these equations are all balanced in terms of mass numbers and atomic numbers. The positron emission, as you might imagine, is similar in ionizing and penetrating power to the beta emission. Positron, it's a positively charged electron, so it's going to have similar ionizing power and penetrating power to the, um, the beta emission, which is an electron. So this is like the mid-sized car type. So here's a summary of all that stuff, which you can read. And this table um, also gives a summary. These are the, the four different types of radiation we've talked about, alpha, beta, gamma, and positrons. Um, what we really need is some examples. Um, we'll have to make those up in a few minutes. Let's talk about detecting radio radioactivity. Um, Radiation is a very useful thing, and so we don't just um, ignore it and hide from it, but we use it. And if you've ever had an x-ray, x-ray involves radiation. And diagnostic imaging and stuff, there's a whole branch of medicine called nuclear medicine, and there's also a lot of research that goes on. Using radioactive isotopes in research can help us to understand a lot of things. Um, and so people who work with radiation need to be monitored to make sure that they don't, they're not exposed to too much radiation. Okay, those, those unfortunate, in a way, early researchers in radiation were exposed to a lot of radiation because they were playing with radioactive substances and they didn't, they didn't know that that could cause problems in their bodies. So one way to monitor is with a film badge dosimeter. So this is a small piece of photographic film in a little case that you wear on your clothes. It's a little badge. And every time you are working around the radioactive material, you wear the badge. And that radioactive, that photographic film is sensitive to the radiation, and it will um, become more and more exposed. And so then they can take the badge and say, okay, you've been using this for two weeks. Let's look at it. Oh, okay, yeah, your, your level of exposure is fine. You're not in any danger. Another way to detect radiation, which... 
um, this, you know, these things show up in cartoons and movies and stuff, is a Geiger counter. It's really a Geiger-Muller counter. And this utilizes a probe. Um, and when it's, there's argon gas in here, and when, when the particles, when the radiation particles from those radioactive substances pass through the chamber, they ionize the argon gas, and they cause electric current to pass through that, and this little handheld device um, makes a note of that, you know, can detect that current passing, and so you get this clicking sound. The clicking is just to help you so you don't have to be looking at the needle all the time, and you can turn that on or off. The radiation itself doesn't make clicking. The device is, is designed to make that clicking sound. But you've probably seen that in movies or cartoons, and they've got this thing, and it goes click, 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 and then over here it doesn't. Another way to detect radiation is a scintillation counter. And in this um, type of a device, you have a material such as sodium iodide or cesium iodide that emits an ultraviolet or a visible light in response to excitation by energetic particles. So when, when this substance, sodium iodide or cesium iodide, is exposed to radiation, it glows. And then you, you could use it just you know, like that, but that would only dis if, if you just used your eyes as a detector, you would only detect really high levels, which you wouldn't want to be doing. And so the instrument is designed to detect the small levels of light and turn that into an electrical signal, which you can see on a reader, um, a meter, I'm sorry. So there's man-made radioactivity, man-made in the sense that we're messing around with elements and stuff and concentrating things, but there's also natural radioactivity. And this is present... Um, everywhere. I grew up in Iowa where um, radon in basements is a significant problem. Radon is the largest noble gas and in some parts of the country there's significant quantities of radon in the soil. And uh, you dig a basement into the dirt and radon can seep into your basement. And radon is radioactive. And so people have little radon detectors in their basements. And then, you, you know, if you've got radon in your basement, then you have a problem and it costs you a lot of money to fix it. And, yeah. Here we don't have basements, so we don't have to worry about that. But there are radioactive substances all over the place. Um, anything, any of the elements beyond atomic number 83, if you look at the periodic table, there's one right up on the wall there. You look at that um, period six. Bismuth underneath, its atomic number is just regular. And then you go the next one over, and the atomic number is in parentheses. I'm sorry, the atomic mass is in parentheses. 209. And everything after that, the, ato the mass, the atomic mass, oh, my brain's dying. The atomic mass is in parentheses. All of those elements are naturally radioactive. We don't have um, as accurate masses for those because they fall apart. They decay. Some of them decay very quickly, and some of them decay very, very slowly. So those elements present in the Earth are a source of radiation, and those can get into your food and your water. Um, and then we also have small amounts of radiation coming from outer space. And that's not science fiction. It's, there's radiation coming from outer space, and the atmosphere protects, it, protects us from most of it, but some of it gets in still. But our bodies are designed to compensate for this. And so if you study um, biochemistry, biological chemistry and you look at how DNA works, um, radiation can cause defects in your DNA, but the way your DNA replicates checks for problems and usually is able to correct it. And so in spite of being exposed to a constant very low level of radiation, we go on with life and we're fine. 
Half-life is, is an important concept when we're talking about radio, um, nuclear chemistry. What half-life means is it's the time it takes for half of the parent nuclide to decay into a daughter nuclide. And what's, what's hard for students to understand sometimes is that that does not mean that after two half-lives you have nothing left. A half-life is after a certain time, so maybe something has a half-life of six years. That means after six years, half of the original sample is gone. It's decayed into something else. In the next six years, though, the rest of the sample doesn't decay. Half decays again. And so the half-life is a span of time, and in each half-life, half the sample decays. And so after two half-lives, you have a quarter left. And after three, you have an eighth left. And so it's not a linear thing. It's, it's very much of a curve. So here's an illustration, a graph. So each of these spheres is representing 0.1 million atoms. And we're looking at a sample of thorium-232, which has a half-life of 14 billion years. Okay, Some of these things decay very slowly. So if you take this sample initially having 10 of these little balls, so 1 million atoms, after 14 billion years, you're going to have half that left, 0.5. After another 14 billion years, you're going to have 0.25. After another, you're going to have 0.125. And after another, you're going to have, what is that, 0.0625? I don't know. I don't want to divide that in my head. But do you see the idea here? With every time interval called a half-life, you cut your sample in half. And so it just keeps going like that. So how long would it take before there were no radioactive atoms left? It would take a really, really long time because it just cuts in half every time. So radioactive nuclides have very differing half-lives. Some of them, like thorium, 14 billion years. That's really, really long. But radon, like I mentioned, is in basements in Iowa. Radon-220 has a half-life of approximately one minute. So every minute, half of it decays. So if you started out with a million radon atoms, after a minute, you'd have half a million. After another minute, you'd have a fourth of a million. That's how half-life works. So here's just a table showing some of the different radioactive nuclides and their half-lives. There's carbon-14. Carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Some of these elements decay into daughter nuclides that are not radioactive. Others decay into daughter nuclides that are also radioactive. And so then you end up with a radioactive decay series. And uranium is, is one that does this. So uranium-238 decays to thorium-234. That's also radioactive. And that decays to pro protactinium-234 which is also radioactive. That decays to uranium-234. Like, oh, it's back to radiating uranium again. Yeah, but it's uranium-234, not 238. It's lost four neutrons. And that keeps going through several steps, including the formation of radon gas, until it eventually gives you lead-206, which is stable. So all of the uranium-238 that is present in the Earth, in its crust and in all anywhere, is slowly decaying away, and eventually it'll all be lead-206. It takes a really, really long time. Because that first step is, has a half-life of 4.47 billion years. 
But some of these are really short. You know, here's 24 days. Then there's another long one. So all of these all of these radioactive nuclides are present in our environment because of uranium-238 decaying. And this is a, just a graph of that series. It's kind of interesting, all the permutations it goes through. So I mentioned this earlier. Um, if there's uranium in the ground, there will be radon also, and that seeps into the air and it can get um, get into your basement. Now, it's just being in your basement isn't dangerous, but if it gets in dust and gets inhaled and gets inside, then it can be dangerous. And so radon actually is the, um, the biggest source of human radiation exposure. So be thankful you don't have a basement. Yeah, so this is this is where I grew up, right around in here. This place, Ames, Iowa, and Wilmer, Minnesota. And you can see that's a pretty high level of radon stuff there. So you just deal with it. So that's a bad thing about radon. Um, I mean, about radiation. Have you heard of radiocarbon dating? For wonder, you know, they, they dig up these dinosaur bones and fossils and they find these artifacts and they say, oh, well, we can tell that it's this many thousands and thousands of years old. How do they do that? How do they do that? Well, for living things, they can use radioactive decay to tell how long it has been dead. Okay? So carbon-14 is present in the environment and present in relatively constant levels. Let's see where this is going. Okay, there, um, so the carbon-14 is, is made in the atmosphere, and then it also is decaying back into nitrogen-14. And so we have this nearly constant equilibrium concentration of atmospheric carbon-14. So living things, whether they're plants or animals, use oxygen. Okay, plants use carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, they, oxygen doesn't matter. We, we use carbon, okay, because so, most of our body, um, a lot of the mo molecules, you know, all the starches and proteins and things all have carbon in them. So our body is taking in carbon and excreting carbon, and so a living organism will have roughly the same proportion of carbon-14 to other forms of carbon as the atmosphere does. Once something dies, though, that exchange of carbon stops. And the carbon-14 that was present when that organism died will slowly decay. And so you can look at how much carbon-14 is left in the organism, and you can do a calculation with half-lives and figure out how old it is. Because every 5,730 years, it will decay by one half. Yeah, I got ahead of myself. Um, it's also helpful that many of the artifacts we find were made from materials that were once living, such as papyrus, wood, other plant and animal, you know, animal skins and things like that. And so anything that was once alive, we can use carbon-14 or radiocarbon dating to figure out how old it is. Now, this is not a precise measurement. It's not going to tell you to the nearest year how old it is, but at least gives us a good idea. So we see that, you know, if you find an object and relative to living organism, it has 25% of the concentration of C14, then you can tell that it's 11,460 years old. So that's a pretty cool use for radioactive substances. Okay, I'm not going to test you on this part at all, but 
it's just kind of interesting because we've all heard of nuclear weapons, right? Atomic bombs and hydrogen bonds, bombs. Um, so way back in the 1930s, Enrico Fermi um, was trying to synthesize a new element by bombarding uranium with neutrons. Um, and so that was kind of interesting, but not enough to talk about it. But he did create a new element, um, and we named, we named that one fermium in honor of him. And then Lisa Meitner was also involved in some of that research, and so there's Meitnerium, which is 109. But the big idea that he had was bombarding the uranium with neutrons. And so some other people um, repeated this and did a little more careful analysis of what those products were. And in 1939, they, uh, Meitner, Strassmann, and Hahn split an atom. So most of this, radi this natural radioactive emission is an unstable nucleus falling apart and emitting particles all by itself. In nuclear fission, we're taking particles and bombarding a larger nucleus, and we're splitting. This is splitting the atom. So they were able to take a uranium atom and split it into barium, krypton, and a tremendous amount of energy. Uranium-235 is, is the isotope that will undergo nuclear fission. The most abundant uranium isotope is 238, and that will not undergo fission. And so in order to do nuclear fission, you have to get enriched uranium. You need to, from that sample of uranium, uranium get rid of most of the 238 and just keep the 235. And so you may have heard stuff about this in the news, you know, all this, com this country has acquired a source of enriched uranium. Well, that means that's uranium with more 235 in it, and so then that can be used to, to build nuclear reactors to generate power, but it can also be used to make nuclear weapons. What happens with um, this fission process is it produces three neutrons. Let's go back to this slide. This process was started by throwing at high speeds a neutron at this uranium-235 atom. When that fission occurs, it generates three more new neutrons. So here's three neutrons. Where are those neutrons going to go? Well, they're just going to go off in random directions, but what's around them? More uranium-235. So these have the potential to hit another uranium-235 and in induce fission in that and generate three more and you get this cascading effect, like this. So one, ur one neutron bombarding one uranium atom causes it to split off and gives you three more. Those can hit three more uranium atoms, and those can split, and then each of those is going to give off three more. And so this becomes a self-amplifying reaction. And this is how you get an explosion because it starts maybe with even just one, and then it quickly grows, and a tremendous amount of energy is released when you do this. So they call it a, a chain reaction, the self-amplifying reaction capable of producing an enormous amount of energy, which we think of as an atomic bomb. You have to have... Um, enough uranium-235, though, for it to be self-sustaining, and we call that the critical mass. You have to have a certain amount of mass of the 235 in order for that to happen. <coughs> you know, some interesting history here. So Einstein wrote a letter to, to President Roosevelt Franklin. It is conceivable, though much less certain, that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be thus constructed. A single bomb of this type carried by boat and exploded in a port might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. 
So there's a little history about the Manhattan Project. Um, the first nuclear weapon was tested in 1945. That bomb had the the force a force equivalent to 18,000 tons of dynamite. That's a lot. So we were working on this atomic bomb, but the Germans didn't manage to get theirs to work, and, and we had defeated by them by that time. So it wasn't used on um, it wasn't used on Germany. It was used on Japan instead. This is a, a photograph of the testing of the first nuclear bomb. It's in New Mexico. There's that mushroom cloud. Uh, nuclear power can also be used to generate electricity. This is kind of interesting too. So here we're also using fission, but instead of blowing people up, we're creating electricity. So you get the um, your enriched uranium in here, and you get this uh, reaction going. It's generating tremendous amounts of heat and energy, and so they use that to heat water. So there's water pumping through here, and this generates steam. The steam turns the turbines and generates the electricity. And then we have, um, there needs to be some cooling happening here. And that's what happened in Japan with the tsunami, is that they had backup generators and everything, but the pumps in the cooling ponds got clogged up, and so they weren't able to cool the water and that's when things got out of hand. They also have control rods in here, and so they can lift the control rods up. The control rods will absorb some of those neutrons. So if you put the control rods in and absorb some of the neutrons, that'll slow down the reaction and keep it from actually exploding, and that's how they control it. Because basically, they have a, an atomic bomb inside that nuclear power plant, but they can control it. Do you remember Chernobyl? That happened when I was in college, so I remember that one. That was that was a big deal. Big. I think that was the biggest accident ever. But that was a huge deal. Um, fission reaction overheated. They were trying to save money on maintenance costs. So, the the nuclear core overheated and and began to burn. The reactor cores in the United States are not made of graphite, and so they're, it's not even possible for them to burn like that one did. Probably the biggest drawback to nuclear power generation is disposing of the waste. Um, that's a problem. Nuclear fission is what powers the sun. Um, fusion and fission are different. Fusion is splitting an atom. We can do that. Fusion is putting two atoms together. We can't do that, but it happens on the sun, and that's where the tremendous energy from the sun comes from, is that two atoms of hydrogen are fused together into an atom of helium. The, the problem with this, the, the great thing about nuclear fusion is it doesn't, cause, it doesn't produce nuclear waste, but the, the problem is, um, it generates such incredibly high temperatures that we have no materials that can contain it. So that's kind of a problem. And we'll stop there. <laughs>